welcome back. Welcome back to round two of the 2015 North American World Championship Qualifier. Uh, before we delve into round two, let's do a quick recap of what happened in round one. After uh, the round was over, we investigated what uh, happened at the end there. It was a little unclear about uh, whether a game loss had been issued or it was simply time had run out in the round and we were unaware of it. Uh, turns out time did run out. Uh, and the, the match was a draw as a result of it. Uh, Bess and Robinson had each won one duel, uh, so they ended the first round with a 1-1 draw. Uh, at the moment where there was some confusion about uh, what was going on, where players appeared to be counting cards to determine uh, what had been done, and there was a fairly long pause on the first, on uh, Robinson's first turn of the second duel, uh, it turned out there was an appeal where uh, they were questioning whether or not the uh, effect of the Galaxy Soldier uh, is an inherent, whether Galaxy Soldier Special Summon is an inherent summon or it uses the chain. Uh, so that was the issue there. Uh, that was properly resolved. Now the answer, of course, is it does start a chain, and you can tell because there's a semicolon yes. in the text. So that is the answer to anyone wondering. Uh, we mentioned on the stream that you're able to use Maxi and Effect Veiler, which is what happened, so uh, that can only be done if it does use the chain. Now, on to this round's match, Ellen Thomas versus Marcelo Parisi. Now, of all of the matchups that I thought that we would ever see at this year's WCQ, this is last on the list, especially with both players already having one win under their belt. Marcelo Parisi is playing Noble Knights, Against Ellen Thomas's Gravekeepers, featuring Secret Village of the Spellcasters. Ellen Thomas's deck is very much in the spirit of today's event because we have Marek Ishtar here, or the voice actor for Marek Ishtar at least, uh, who, as viewers of the animated series know, is the guardian of the tombs. Uh, so he can identify fairly well with the Gravekeepers. And now Ellen Thomas is here using that deck. Uh, and hoping to take a victory over Marcelo Parisi and his Noble Knights. Now, Thomas's deck is very geared towards just blanking as many of Necroz's cards as possible, making them impossible to play. She's got Secret Village of the Spellcasters in the main deck. Royal Tribute can knock out the entirety of a Necroz player's hand. And Hidden Temples of Necro Valley, if played while you have Necro Valley and a Gravekeeper, stops all non-Gravekeeper special summons. Right. And if that weren't enough, she's also using Thunder King Ryo to further stop searching uh, for ritual spell cards or Necro's monsters. And Grave uh, Necro Valley, of course, which prevents cards from being banished from the grave. Thomas starts with Gravekeeper's Commandant. Discarding that to the graveyard to go search for Necro Valley, the all-important field spell. Necro Valley gives all Gravekeepers 500 attack and defense and also negates the effect of any card that tries to move a card other than itself from the graveyard and prevents things in the graveyard from being banished. And that spell card that you see there is Hidden Temples of Necro Valley preventing special summons. She's off to a good start. Uh, players can't special summon monsters now. Uh, I, I didn't catch what her second back row was. Uh, it's a Dimensional Prison. Okay, it's a Dimensional Prison. Uh, so she does have a strong field, but it does appear to be fairly vulnerable because uh, if either the Necro Valley or the Gravekeeper's Descendant leaves the field, uh, that hidden, val hi hidden Temples of Necro Valley will go down with it. Uh, so we'll see momentarily whether she can maintain this powerful position she's currently in. This is interesting. The Drow is the normal summon for Marcelo Parisi, and it looks like he's got a pair of Forbidden Lances. Now, hang on. We've got, looks like the effect of... Let's go ahead and bring up Hidden Temples of Necro Valley for a moment. As based on my previous reading, uh, this shouldn't be possible. Neither player can special summon except Gravekeeper's monsters. So you can't actually activate the effect of Noble Knight Madro right now. Noble Arms Excalibur prevents your Noble Knight from being targeted by uh, your opponent's card effects, which will help because Dimensional Prison, strange as it seems, actually does target. Okay, it looks like they've figured out they can't special summon here. Yes, it took 
a little longer than I would expect, considering yes. that she played that card specifically to stop things like this from happening. Uh, yeah, so suddenly Parisi's actually looking pretty good if yep. the uh, Dimensional Prism can't stop him. Dimensional Prism can't stop him, and he goes to the battle phase, attacks Descendant, and activates the Forbidden Lance. Now that is twofold. The Lance not only will give a minus 800 to the attack points of Descendant, as per its own effect, it'll also block the boost from Necro Valley. So essentially it'll drop to 1500, and then 800 more to 700. Yes. <coughs> she flips the Dimensional Prism, which does not work, can't be targeted, and it'll go back face down. Sorry, I guess just explain like, what it does. There's no legal activation there. Yep. Right. So a pair of minor procedural errors start us off. Nothing that can't be repaired. Yep. And nothing that wasn't repaired. Uh, but that's it. The uh, descendants go into the graveyard with the Gravekeeper's monster off of the field. The Hidden Temples of Necro Valley goes down with it. That's a heavy blow. Uh, that was a tremendous blow. And it doesn't stop Madro from activating its effect anymore. Yeah. It was something fortunate for Thomas uh, because she probably didn't know what Parisi was running. Maybe she did. Uh, if he had been running a Necro's deck, that opening would have been outstanding. Absolutely devastating. Can't use the graveyard, can't special summon monsters. 2,000 attack monster on the field. That would have been very difficult to overcome. Now, Madro, when alone and equipped, becomes a level 5 dark monster with the effect to summon another Noble Knight from the deck and then destroy a Noble Arms card on the field. He's taken Boars in this case. Boars is similar. Light most of the time, but dark level 5 when he's equipped with the Noble Arms. And in this case, he's equipped with Guinevere, who is a monster that can be equipped from the hand or graveyard to a Noble Knight. And her effect depends on what attribute that Noble Knight is. Boars is a dark monster, uh, unlocks Guinevere's assassination ability. Let's her destroy herself and the opposing monster whenever that knight would get into battle. And since it's a card that moves itself out of the graveyard, it can still be uh, brought back from the graveyard while Necro Valley's on the field. Boars himself, while equipped, lets you reveal three noble knight, or rather, three noble arms cards from your deck. And your opponent randomly selects one, and that's put into your hand, and the remaining two go to the graveyard. So basically what you're doing with Noble Knights a lot of the time is trying to load up your graveyard with a lot of different Noble Arms cards and then bring them all back with one of the Noble Knight Xyz monsters, which can bring three different Noble Arms back when they're Xyz summoned. So we're in main phase two now. Noble Arms Caliburn is equipped to Madrill. Caliburn gives your monster plus 500 attack and also lets you gain 500 life points each time it's uh, once per turn each time it's on the field I say each time it's on the field because most of the noble arms have an ability to bring themselves back from the graveyard if they're destroyed so doing so would reset that once per turn on Caliban so there you've got two level 5 monsters and uh, Parisi needs to be careful about that Necro Valley yes uh, unfortunately for Thomas, he knows that her face-down card is a dimensional prison, so I don't expect we'll see he walks into that in a way um, that devastates like him. He's got uh, how many copies of Excalibur? Three full copies of Excalibur. So he could practically give himself a two-thirds shot at one. He goes ahead and activates the Boar's effect, so, and he gets Noble Arms of Destiny that prevents destruction by things. Like he keeps pulling further ahead here. Yeah, he keep, gets Galatin. Uh, Galatin's plus 1,000 attack, but loses 200 during each standby phase, I believe, each of your standby phases. He doesn't get any of the Excaliburns. It could be that his plan here, knowing that the face down is Dimensional Prison, is uh, to try to stop his opponent who would just be trying to stop his opponent from uh, resolving a Gravekeeper Spy or anything like that? Noble Knight Bedware, that's from the uh, box set, one of the new cards in the box set. When you normal summon or special summon it, can send a Noble Arms card to the graveyard, so we see the Excalibur there. Looks like well, almost all of these cards he's played are from that box set. Yeah, these are the uh, Platinum Rare technology yeah. cards. Cool-looking cards. I don't know that camera necessarily does them justice. 
is I remember we tried to photograph them yeah. for uh, a strategy site piece back when it first came out, and it took us the better part of the day to get the lighting right in such a way that the cards would appear on film the way that they actually do when you look at them. Yeah. They look a lot better in person. <laughs> now, the Noble Arms bring themselves out of the graveyard, so those won't be stopped by Necro Valley. But what happened here is Bedware uses other ability, which lets you change the target of a Noble Arms card that's already on the field. So in this case, he's moved Caliburn from Madro to Bedwar. That makes it so that Madro is no longer level 5 Dark Monster. He's a light level 4 monster again, and that means he can be used as Xyz material for Artorigus, King of the Noble Knights, the rank 4 monster. And that is exactly what the Doctor ordered. So the trick here is that he doesn't need to use Artorigus' effect to equip three Noble Arms cards from the graveyard. Because he used Bedwer to shift it over, he still has that once per turn bringing it back out of the graveyard effect. Not negated by Necro Valley, it's bringing itself back. And that leaves him with two Noble Arms cards on the field, which will let him destroy both of his opponent's spell and trap cards. So both the Prison and the Necro Valley will go. And Artorgus is at 2,500 attack. So we will make short work of that Gravekeeper spot. In addition, uh, Bors is both at 2,000 attack and able to just take out whatever it attacks right away. This is going downhill pretty quickly for Thomas. What's happening now is that the first Excalibur that was sent to the Gravekeeper, not the second, is being banished as essentially a rank-up magic to be used on or a ranked out magic. It lets you swap out one of the Noble Knight Xyz monsters yeah, for the other one. <laughs> so rank four king becomes rank five king, sacred Noble Knight of King Artorgus. And now that one can use its ability to bring back three Noble Arms cards from the graveyard. So it's got Excalibur, protecting it from being targeted by card effects. Destiny, which lets you not be destroyed by anything once per turn. And Calibur, which is the plus 500 attack, and lets you gain life points. And the king's ability here is to detach a material to destroy a monster on the field. That's devastating. So much of the Noble Knight strategy involves getting to those Noble Arm cards. Yeah, people debate endlessly how many cards, how many different Noble Arms you should play to make sure that you have one in your start of hand, because without it, you're kind of hosed. Looks like he's using the Artorgus' effect to destroy the spy, uh, and now he has a tremendous field with a nearly invincible Xyz monster. Got 4,500 points of attack on the board. And interestingly enough, uh, he actually does run a few traps. Most Noble Knight players, I observe, either don't run any traps or run like one copy of Solemn's Golding to go with all the life points that they're gaining from Caliburn. At this point, he's actually got actual monster effect negation uh, with breakthrough skill. Some prevention in the form of emptiness, Vanity's emptiness, and a torrential tribute. Pot of Duality comes down for Ellen Thomas, and she gets her pick of three cards that don't super help. I don't think there is anything that helps here. Yeah, she's going to take the Assailant and see if she can't do some attack position finagling with it. But in yeah. the end, I don't think it's super helps. Yeah, I mean, she's down to one card against the seven cards on Parisi's field, plus the pair of cards in his hand. She's then got, she drew one more. Yeah, she's got Necro Valley and the Assailant now yeah. with only 2,300 life points. One of those monsters can't be targeted with the Assailant's ability, and the other will be taken out by Guinevere if they try. Right. Uh, what is Boris's, like, current, like, situation right now? He is 2,000. <laughs> okay. Quick check of Boris's current status. He is a 2,000 attack so level 5 is, dark monster. Is he is equipped no with Guinevere. Oh, okay. Guinevere's current effect is to so destroy herself no and an enemy attack. monster at the start of the damage step. That's even uh, before monsters flip face up. Actually, it's at the start of that's cool. the damage step. So Salem is summoned with Necrogon. 
the attack is declared to try to switch it. And Parisi is now explaining what Guanafar is going to do here. So it's just exactly what you just mentioned. Salen's taken out. Boris is back to being the plain old level four light warrior monster. But Thomas does not have anywhere near enough life points to survive this next turn. It's like direct attacks from Boars and Sacred Noble Knight of King Artorgus are just going to finish her off. Yep, and that's what happens here. And we'll be heading on into game two. Now, the crazy thing is, like I'm looking over here at Ellen Thomas' side deck, and it's almost like she knew this was going to happen. She has a couple good cards. In particular. For this matchup. And uh, we can see this at the table right now. She's eyeing some spell-shattering arrows, which is generally not the card that people use when they want to destroy a lot of face-up spell and trap cards. Most people pick Fairy Wind, as it can take out traps as right. well as spells, even though the damage isn't as great, and it also hits yourself. Uh, but in this case, spell-shattering arrow is exactly the sort of card you want, because every card is going to be a spell, and you can rack up a lot of damage really quickly. Yes. So, so Thomas's main deck, as we mentioned before, is very geared toward beating Necro's decks. Yes. Uh, with the inclusion of hidden temples of Necro Valley, secret village of spellcasters, and stuff like that, Thunder King Ryo. Uh, when you build your deck in that way, the side deck becomes even more important because when you don't play against those decks that you were anticipating playing against, uh, you want to be able to adjust your deck between duels. Uh, so that you can optimize your chance of winning in games two and three. Uh, we're likely to, to see that here as Thomas sides out quite a few cards. Yeah, I think we're going to see a, a bigger focus on Secret Village of the Spellcasters here. So like I was mentioning before, if you don't draw any Noble Arms, you're hosed. But if you draw a bunch of Noble Arms and you can't play them because of Secret Village of the Spellcasters, you're also hosed. Yes, that, that's true. Do you think we're still going to see Hidden Temples of Necro Valley? After uh, how it fared no. in Duel 1? I think those are being swapped for more copies of Secret Village of the Spellcasters. Uh, I agree. I, I think it's too hard to keep a Gravekeeper's monster and the Necro Valley on the field uh, in this particular matchup uh, where... It's many of the normal knights have more than 1,500 attack points. And Especially when there are monster boosted. removal effects. That too. So, for example, Gwynefar is, uh, she's not actually the activation of a spell. When you equip her, you're activating a monster effect. So that gets around Secret Village of the Spellcasters, and it turns a lot of uh, Parisi's monsters into just monster-destroying threats that can take out your face of Spellcaster and then lock you out of your own spell cards. What do you think of Mirror Force here? There's Mirror Force in her side deck as well. Mirror Force is shockingly not useful. Now, if it's Mirror Force in combination with Secret Village and your opponent can't put a Noble Arms of Destiny on their monster, then it could be very helpful. It's also worth noting that the light effect of Gwenefar destroys herself instead of the monster she's equipped to when it would be destroyed by a card effect. So there are multiple layers of protection against things like Mirror Force. It's Prison that's the one you have to watch out for. The entire Noble Knight strategy is like you're trying to create this invincible army that doesn't care what your opponent throws at you. And sometimes that takes the form of one of the big kings with a bunch of equips on it. But more often it's you know two or three smaller knights with one or two equips on each of them. We saw a little both in Duel 1 for yep. Parisi. It's like uh, it's like pitching, where you climb the ladder, you throw low, then middle, then high, to try to set the batter up to strike out. It's a lot like that. You'll start either you know, with one or two noble knights in the game, in the first game, and then bring out the king to win. But in the second game, you go for the king straight away, and then if they get past that, which they probably won't, because they think you're going to play the other way, then you clear them out. Your baseball yeah. references are lost on me, but the rest of it made sense. You live in New York, <laughs> dude. Come on. Yeah, but that was a really in any case, uh, Parisi also has cards in his side deck that we can certainly expect to be put in here. Uh, Parisi has two copies of Mystical Space Typhoon, which seem like they would be fairly ideal against a deck yeah, both yeah, based on a field, field spell spells. card, so uh, for destroying Necro Valley. 
Uh, it's got Shadow Imprisoning Mirror. I, I don't know if I really like that card against Grave Keepers, though. It's okay against them, but the thing you have to watch out for is that it's also okay against you. Yeah. Because your monsters turn dark. So I don't know if it's super worth that risk. He has a Noble Arms in his side deck as well. Oh, yeah, what do we got over there? I don't, I'm not even going to try to pronounce oh, it. Oh, Arfiduter. So that's uh, that's Lonzolin's yeah. blade. Uh, it destroys face downs, face down cards, monsters or spells and traps, so. and uh, drops your monsters attack by 500. It also has the ability to come back from a graveyard on its own. And we see Merlin to start out. He's one of the new cards in that box set. He acts. Well, his first effect is like a Lone Fire Blossom for Noble Knights. And his second effect lets you banish him from the graveyard to uh, Synchro Summon or Xyz Summon a Noble Knight monster from your extra deck as a quick effect. Probably not going to see that effect used in this deck. It's activated, and Vanity's Emptiness is flipped face up. That'll stop all the special summons. Already used. Oh, normal summon for turn. That'll do it. And we see Thomas has picked up a royal tribute. Oh, flips up oh, Gravekeeper yeah. Spy. Oh, we forgot about Throne Vanity's emptiness yeah. there. Backfired. But she still has the Gravekeeper's Descendant. Get some use out of that. Yeah, I can believe it differently. I think what I would have done is summon the Descendant first and then drop Royal Tribute. It would discard all monsters from both players' hands, and it will. Uh, but in this case, the number is zero, so everything is just as it was before. So that's really good for Parisi. He just got Ellen Thomas to use her Royal Tribute and get nothing out of it. Yeah, lost a Spy, lost a Royal Tribute, yeah. lost Vanity's Emptiness. Lost the Vanity's Emptiness, too. Out. And we know that uh, Parisi has his own Vanity's Emptiness face down, so seeing hers go to the graveyard is just great for him. Uh, yeah, the um, minor error in sequencing there. Had she Royal Tribute first, Vanity's Emptiness would have gone to the grave and she'd be able to special summon a monster from her deck with Gravekeeper Spy. I think it's just a case of being caught off guard Yeah, by the last strategy that you ever expected to see at the event. Could be that. Could be nervous on camera. Also possible. Some players work well on camera than others. Reinforcement of the Army drops for Parisi. Excellent card to have in this situation. And Dro is the pick there. And he's got plenty of noble arms, as his opponent just saw. Certainly does. I would not be shocked if things get a little crazy. Noble arms of destiny. He is equipped in the drill. And the effect is activated. And we took a look at Noble Knight Brothers there for a moment. I think he's considering whether or not uh, he wants to go for that rank four Artura display again. Seems like it would be pretty good, right? Uh, it'd be pretty good, but there's the matter of needing to have all the Noble Arms. Destiny is destroyed, comes back on Boars. The way that just works around Necro Valley is too perfect in this matchup. Yes, there's a lot of stuff that just really works in a Noble Knight player's advantage yeah. in this particular matchup. For example, uh, there's a two-thirds chance that we will see Gwynifar manage to come back without being interrupted by Necro Valley. And we can see he did side in the Arfidubra there. That's specifically for destroying lots of face-down cards. Perfect for this matchup, not so perfect for anything else. Oh, there it is. And he hit the one in three chance that Gwynoir would be added to his hand. So if either of the other two gets picked, you essentially get two Noble Knight, or two Noble Arms cards for the price of none, instead of one in this case. So that worked out well for Ellen Thomas. I don't think it's gonna be enough. Pretty far behind again. Excalibur comes down. That'll protect the draw from the dreaded 
dimensional prison once again. And it is joined by Guinevere. Watch out, Mr. Parisi. You don't have any spell and trap zones left. Jaro attacks. Guinevere destroys the descendant. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to make sure. And the reason that you do that is to make sure that Madro stays on the field. You definitely don't want to drop your uh, Madro equipped with Excalibur into the graveyard when you definitely don't have to. So Thomas draws another Necro Valley. Uh, he can't do anything with that right now. He already has a Necro Valley in play. The Spy goes to defense. 2,500 defense thanks to Necro Valley, but no amount of defense will stop Guinevere from doing her work. Boris starts things up again on Parisi's turn. This time we've got Galton, Caliburn. Looks like he is loading up on attack points this time around. He already has a destiny, and you can only control one of each of the basic noble arms. So he passes on destiny and gets another Excalibur. And if memory serves me correctly, Excalibur is the one that you can control multiples of. Yeah, I was like, I'm doing the. Sorry, big. Big words. I heard bandit. I'm like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> this sucks. Yes, indeed it is. It's just the case of you can only use the effect to rank up once per turn. All right, with the selection made, Guinevere is going to come back. And the trick here is that you want to make sure that Guinevere is on the monster protected by Excalibur. Most important thing is getting rid of the monster. If Boars is lost to a dimensional prison, then say la vie. You can just get another one out with Madro. Yep. In this case, though, Boris is safe, and he gets in there for 1,700 damage. Thomas draws Pot of Duality. Uh, the none of those are helpful. He reveals Terraforming, which is completely useless because he gets another Necro Valley, Imperial Tombs of Necro Valley, and Mystical Space Typhoon. Uh, neither of those will help to alleviate the situation where she's facing down two monsters that are threatening direct attacks. All right. Well, she has. She gets the terraforming and then flips the face down this space typhoon to destroy Excalibur. Sequencing seems a little off there. I didn't know. Like it looked like she was revealing and then using mystical space typhoon, but that's not the case. Terraforming was the choice. Then space typhoon was flipped. And he activates terraforming, which can get a secret village of the spellcasters. Not that it particularly helps when you have no spellcaster. I forgot you can actually get that, but you're right. It doesn't do anything without a spellcaster on the field. So it could just be a case of, well, here's what I was trying to do. I should yeah. at least show the namesake yeah, of right. my deck. <laughs> this is my deck. What my deck is supposed to do. Yeah. I definitely have that feeling a lot. Yeah. When I build something that doesn't quite work out the way I want it to. I'm going to you know, get as many pieces of what I'm trying to do out as I can, even though it falls apart when <laughs> they're not all there together. Uh, she could theoretically... Uh, oh, and we see that uh, Parisi just picked up Kaiser Coliseum. And that goes back to what my baseball analogy that you didn't understand. All you right. start game one with the multiple monsters and consolidate into one. Then when you side in Kaiser Coliseum, you start with the one monster and drop Kaiser Coliseum to lock your opponent out of the game. I see. So he, he shifted his strategy a little bit between duels one and two. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is really tough for Thomas also because if she does play the secret village of the spellcasters, she'll lose her Necro Valley, right? Correct. She needs that attack point boost to even get over Parisi's monsters. That's the thing that really interests so me in the construction of this deck is... You're making a deck that essentially relies on two different field spells. And they aren't exactly, it's not a situation 
where it's you know terraforming and field spell, you can consider both to be a copy of that field spell because they're two different things. So it's like having six copies of two different field spells, but right. it's still two different field spells. Right. So so it's kind of curious. Uh, I definitely think it's an interesting choice, and I think it, think it works in the current advanced format against the most popular decks because of the fact that you don't need to lock down the graveyard against you know, a Necro's deck if they can't play spell cards, and you don't need the 500 attack point boost if they can't play spell cards. Or you know, if you can lock down the graveyard against other decks, maybe it's okay if they activate spell cards. I'm just going to go uh, ahead and play that Secret Village. But the problem here, as we can all see, uh, is yeah, now she can't play any yeah. other spell cards. Yeah, she can't play spell cards, and Parisi's not using a Necro's deck. <laughs> He's no. using a Noble Knight deck. So the uh, standard strategy that she was anticipating using against the top decks is just not going to work here. Now, here's and the thing. If she had that village instead of the Necro Valley at the start of the game, we'd be seeing a completely different match right now. That is true. None of these spells could be activated. That is true. He, he would... Yeah, he, he wouldn't be nearly in the position he's in right now. Uh, but now that they've already been placed on the table, yep. I don't know how much that secret village is going to help. And he can still play spell cards right now because that right. lone spellcaster is face down. So it, it doesn't even count. Uh, and what, uh, what he really needs is a monster to just put this one to bed right now Yeah, and get out of the round with a win. And he does have a monster. Looks like he has night drop. Right? Yep, he's got another one of them, and he's already got the... Uh... Oh, he's going to go ahead and see something. Oh, that's another way to do it. I forgot that both of them are level 5 at the moment. And that'll take care of all of his problems. This also isn't the activation of a spell card. It's just using the effect of the spell. So even with a spellcaster, Village wouldn't stop this. Yeah. Caliburn for 2,500 attack, Destiny for destruction prevention, Excaliburn for targeting protection, and the effect of Sacred Noble Knight of King Artorgas to take out the spy. It's not enough damage in this case, though. It's only 2,500. But Thomas has had enough anyways, and decides to pack things up and try again next round. Yeah, so that was definitely not the matchup she was hoping for. Uh, did not go well for the Gravekeeper's deck. That, did, but that was not a match that anybody yeah, was expecting, really. certainly worked out for Marcelo Parisi, who huh? was able to just dominate a deck that was otherwise teched out to try to beat the most popular decks in the format. Uh, and that's the advantage you get when you run a unique deck like Parisi did here. Oh, and Ellen Thomas was trying to get that advantage, too. That's true, but that's also the risk you run. And it's so. generally the first three rounds where things like that come up. So yes. Thomas more than likely played against the Necroz deck first round, clobbered them. Seems likely. Comes here and runs into somebody else trying to do the exact same thing as yeah. her. And then it's an interesting uh, you know, matchup because it becomes... It, it's two decks face off against each other, both of them designed for a specific purpose to beat a different deck, and now suddenly their strength and weak, strengths and weaknesses just clash against one another. And you get an interesting matchup, like we saw here, where Parisi's, uh, you know, noble, noble knights, uh, noble knights, belt, noble arm spell cards would just come back from the graveyard under Necro Valley, and he was largely unaffected by Necro Valley. So we will keep track of Marcelo Parisi for the rest of the day, but for now, he takes a 2 0 win over Ellen Thomas in round two. Stay tuned, because we've got more of the brand new Yu Gi Oh! Arc 5 series for you. See you next round.